Hello, and welcome to the July 2024 edition of the U.S. and Energy Insights. I am your host, Pamela Munger, and I'll be taking a look at the latest trends and market conditions within U.S. and global energy and sharing actionable insights powered by Vortex's trucking analytics. In this insight, we will focus on global crude exports, get an update on the TMX pipeline and crude exports out of Vancouver. We'll also take a look at Atlantic Basin clean product demand and the Dengote factor. Lastly, we'll cover super tanker cleanups and the impact to freight. Total crude and condensate seaborne exports fell by almost 180,000 barrels per day in June, marking the fourth consecutive monthly decline and putting full month exports at the lowest level since August, 2023. The largest declines were seen in exports from Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iraq, and Kuwait. Now, to some degree, non-OPEC countries helped to compensate for the lower OPEC exports. U.S. exports rose by 290,000 barrels per day, month on month, while Angola and Brazil grew 110,000 barrels per day and 80,000 barrels per day. Russian crude exports via the sea, excluding Kazakh origin grades, CPC blend and Kepco were little changed month on month. Now the bulls in the market may put some hope in the recently announced SPR refills in China. China plans to add 8 million tons of crude oil at the majors controlled storages by March, 2025. Now this is equivalent to 2% of China's seaborne crude imports. And the top four oil majors, tank utilization is just over 60%, meaning they are able to fulfill the target without adding new storage base. However, oil prices above $85 per barrel may put immediate stock builds in check, especially as weak Chinese refinery runs persist. And you can see here that implied refinery runs using Vortex's onshore inventories and crude import data are likely to dilute the SPR buying. Now, taking a further look into US seaborne crude exports, we can see on the left hand side chart that Canadian crude exports out of Vancouver surpass those from the US Gulf Coast while the right-hand side chart highlights the Canadian crude exports to Asia reaching record highs. Looking ahead, the global decline in seaborne exports is a strong support factor for outright crude prices, as opposed to any momentum from the demand side, which certainly appears to largely be lacking this year. On a global basis, if we look at June readings for travel fuels in the top 100 import ports, we can see that imports eased versus the spring dynamics, which we witnessed in the first half of the year. Now, motor fuel imports are just as high as last year, but not higher. Margins, nevertheless, are lower, which points to an ample supply potential apart from range-bound demand. Now, the latest trend for gasoline and jet is not upwards in spite of the summer travel season. Now, if we take a look at East Coast Canada and the U.S. Atlantic Coast, we have seen an increased share of clean product imports from Europe. However, the spike has been short-lived. Now, the spike from Asia was due to higher levels of jet imports and blending components into Pad 1. Gasoline imports in May reached levels above 12 and 24 months, but have fallen underneath seasonal norms. Meanwhile, America's West Coast clean product imports continue to look towards Asia. Peru has been importing diesel, and the U.S. West Coast has been importing more diesel from Northeast Asia. Panama Canal constraints have also kept flows to this region somewhat constrained, as well as high freight demand between the U.S. Gulf Coast and East Coast Mexico and the Caribbean. The bullish light in all of this has been Mexico East Coast, 
where we have seen gasoline imports surge. Now this is mainly due to refining inefficiencies and unplanned outages that have moved the needle on Mexico's refining run rates from a multi-year high reached in March of 65.3%, which has fallen down to around 51.8% in May. And a quick check on rising crude exports, especially Maya, indicate that the 340,000 barrel per day Dos Bocas refinery has yet to start. Although we have seen official reports that the refinery will start on February 28th, 2024, media outlets say that despite promises made by Mexico's energy and ministry, the refinery will not be expected to process crude until the end of 2024. Now a quick look at the Dengote startup where we have assumed that the Dengote crude intake of 600,000 barrels per day, of which 200,000 barrels per day is imported from the US, and we see product output with gasoline at 325,000 barrels per day, all of which replaces seaborne imports. And this is primarily from Northwest Europe, which you can see in purple in the chart. Diesel, we expect 150,000 barrels per day of production, of which 50,000 barrels per day could be exported to Europe. And jet fuel, we expect a production of around 45,000 barrels per day, of which 30,000 barrels per day could be exported to Northwest Europe. Now the freight impact on clean products is probably the most significant, where we see 8 million ton miles per month decrease for clean products and 4 million ton miles per month in crude. Lastly, a quick look at super tanker cleanups, which are keeping LRs east of Suez and could exert more pressure on MRs. Now, one of the key trends that have unfolded in the tanker market from the start of this year is this switch from crude to clean, which we've witnessed on LR2 tankers. And this is really reflecting the strong earning potential of LR2s compared to Aframaxes. However, lately, the dirty to clean switches have entered a new dimension by occurring on bigger tankers. And according to our data, there are at least 15 Suez Maxes and four VLCCs, which have either have or are in the process of switching from carrying dirty to clean cargoes this year. These tankers are involved primarily in voyages predominantly originating from the Middle East, mainly the Middle East and India, and destined towards the west of Suez. Now, none of these vessels are newly built vessels, which can carry clean cargoes as part of its maiden voyage. Now, historically, these types of switches on larger vessels has been occurring rarely, predominantly by oil companies that were owning or having long-term chartering a vessel, and the switch was facilitating the transporting operations. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thank you for watching. If you found the U.S. Energy Insights helpful, please take a look at our newly launched MENA Insights featuring my colleague Jay Maru, where he focuses on changing dynamics in the Middle East and Asia. We hope you join us in August for the next edition of the U.S. Energy Insights. Thank you very much.